I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Calabrese for the invitation. Although, quite honestly, I wasn't sure exactly why I was invited, but uh, Ed seemed to know, even though I wasn't aware, that I do work in the field of uh, hormesis, uh, and that the molecule that I study can be considered a hormetin now after I've been at this meeting for the last two days. So thanks, Ed, for enlightening me from to my own research area. So what I'd like to talk to you today is about the role of um, carbon monoxide in, uh, uh, as a potential anti-obesity agent. And why would you commit, uh, consider carbon monoxide a hormetic or a, a horm hormetin? Well, one of the reasons why is this first slide right here, which demonstrates what most people think about carbon monoxide is that it is a killer. It is responsible for over 100 in, uh, deaths per year in people, which uh, mainly occur through accidental inhalation, over-inhalation. Um, toxicologists like to measure carbon monoxide in uh, parts per million. And so the effects that you see uh, 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 of carbon monoxide uh, poisoning are in the area of over 1,000 parts per million, or 0.1 percent. However, as biologists, um, we know, excuse me, we know that carbon monoxide is actually endogenously produced through the actions of heme oxygenase. Uh, and uh, along with carbon monoxide, heme oxygenase also breaks down intercellular heme to biliverdin, which is rapidly converted by the enzyme biliverdin reductase to bilirubin. Now, how I got involved in all this is that I've been studying the cardiovascular actions of heme oxygenase for quite some years now. And about 12 years ago, there's a series of papers that came out that showed quite convincingly that upregulation of heme oxygenase, either chemically or genetically, uh, uh, was associated with reduced body weight prevention of obesity. And I became very interested in that, but nobody knew, there was no really, no real mechanisms of how heme oxygenase had these profound effects on body weight. Was it through directly, through actions of heme oxygenase? Was it through the metabolites, lights, bilirubin, or carbon monoxide? So I got very interested in how can I alter the levels of carbon monoxide to start looking at some of these metabolites of heme oxygenase without altering the levels of heme oxygenase itself? without having to worry about increases in bilirubin, increased iron, increased ferritin. I just wanted to study carbon monoxide. And it was about the same time I was looking at the cardiovascular actions of heme oxygenase, and I had similar questions in that area too. So I stumbled upon these drugs, these class of drugs called CORMs, or carbon monoxide releasing molecules. There's, these are the very early generation, the initial CORMs, CORM 1, 2, and 3. Quorum 1 and 2 are really nice molecules. I use them in a uh, renal protection experiment, but the problem I didn't like them is they're not lipid soluble. I mean, they're, they're lipid soluble, but these have to be uh, placed in organic compounds. They're not soluble in water at all. So I wasn't really uh, that thrilled with those compounds. Then there came out this compound here, Quorum 3, which is water soluble, but it's a very fast releaser of carbon monoxide. I settled upon, that just upon that time, this compound, Quorum A1, was reported in the literature. It's water soluble. It's a slow CO releaser, has a half-life of about, I would say, 30 minutes, where these compounds have half-lives in about 10-minute uh, time intervals. So I, was, I, I had a, uh, collaborated with a chemist at the uh, University of Mississippi in Oxford, and he uh, made me a bunch of this uh, Quorum A1. It wasn't commercially available at the time. And we basically asked an experiment. Well, the first experiment we looked at uh, was what happened to um, blood carboxyhemoglobin levels after exposure to this agent. Now, what I wanted to do is I didn't want to get criticized that we were doing, having some kind of an effect of increased carboxyhemoglobin levels and some kind of, you know, hypoxic effect of the, the treatment with the drug. So we wanted to find a dose, the highest dose that we could of this compound to give uh, IP, an interperitoneal injection, what was the low, highest dose that we can give that really didn't change blood carboxyhemoglobin levels? So we we've, uh, did a couple of different doses, and the dose that we found was about five milligrams per kilogram. I just wanted you to note that seven milligrams per kilogram increases blood carboxyhemoglobin levels at the peak of about 50%. Now, normally, 
the blood carboxyhemoglobin levels in a mouse that we measure in, in our lab is about 3%. Uh, so it's not a huge increase, but I didn't, again, I didn't want anybody to criticize or say, hey, you know, this is due to alterations in oxygen transport. So this was the highest dose that we tested, which we didn't see any change at all in blood carboxyhemoglobin levels. So we went with this dose. We administered this. We also have what's called an inactive quorum. Uh, this is a, a compound where you basically make up uh, the quorum, but you put it in a solution and it loses all of its carbon monoxide. Okay, but it has the chemical backbone, and it's an active quorum or I quorum. So we decided a treatment regimen where we gave this dose every other day, and the first model we did was what we like to call a prevention study. We started these mice right after they were weaned, about uh, four weeks of, of age. We put them on a high-fat diet, uh, a diet consisting of 60% of the kilocalories derived from fat. All right, so they basically eat that as much of that as they want. In this study, we had one control group which was on a regular uh, fat-free, uh, or normal fat diet, not a fat-free diet, but a normal fat diet. And we gave them the quorum every other day, and we, let, we, 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 met, we went out about 32 weeks. And what you can see over the initial 10 weeks, we really didn't see much, uh, uh, up to about 15 weeks, we really didn't see much difference in body weight for the quorum uh, treated animals. And I sort of forgot about the study, the postdoc was doing the study. And I was asking initially, what's going on? Oh, not much difference in body weight. So I kind of lost interest, to be honest with you. But after this time period, uh, from about 16 weeks to the end of the time period, the mice really quit gaining weight on a high fat diet. Whereas the other mice in the control group, or the mice that were treated with an inactive compound, continued to uh, gain weight throughout the entire uh, study. Now this is very nice if I could tell, and, and you know, we could predict who was gonna be, become obese um, in, in the general population, but in the real world it doesn't, look, it doesn't work that way. This is the way that things work in the real world. You come in with animals or people that are already obese. And this is a study, we put the mice on a high fat diet for about uh, uh, four or five months, and we let them get body weights uh, about 50 grams, uh, we had a control group that, for some reason, these animals started out a little bit less body weights, but by the end of the time experiment, you see that they, all, they caught up with the other control groups. We added a few more control groups. We added a saline group just to inject the mice, just to see if there's some kind of stress that's associated with these IP injections. Again, we gave the uh, inactive form of the carbon monoxide donor and the active form of the carbon monoxide donor, five milligrams per kilogram every other day. And we let, again, we went out for 30 weeks. And this time we saw a, a pretty much, we started to see changes in body weight at much earlier time points, about seven weeks uh, of treatment. The body weight in the uh, quorum treated animals uh, was significantly reduced, almost by 50%, by, by 40%, uh, whereas we saw no effect in all the other treatment groups. So now we've shown that not only can we prevent dietary induced obesity in these mice, but more importantly, we can reverse the effects of dietary induced obesity, at least on body weight, uh, in these studies. Um, the quorum uh, study, and this again, this is just data from what I'm gonna call the reversal study. The quorum also was associated with a decrease in uh, fat mass. Uh, we measured this by whole body echo MRI to get the body composition. Uh, we did it every uh, six weeks uh, during the study. We started to see effects about 12 weeks, and these effects were sustained all the way up to 30 weeks. Now, I didn't show this data, but the other important thing is when most people diet, they lose muscle mass rather than fat mass. So you, you preferentially, you, you know, you quit eating and you start to lose muscle mass. So what happened in these guys, though, is they didn't actually lose muscle mass. They actually gained muscle mass uh, as the time went out. I, I didn't show that data, but they have decreases in body fat and increases in lean muscle mass. And again, at the end of this study, you see that we looked at the fat distribution the different fat pads, the epididymal, the visceral, and the total fat pads were all decreased in these mice treated with uh, uh, the carbon monoxide donor. So how does quorum promote weight loss? How, do these, how does carbon monoxide lead to weight loss? Well, there's three different pathways that you can think about. The first pathway would be to decrease food intake, uh, which would result in lower in body weight. The second one would be to boost metabolism, to increase oxygen consumption to burn more fat, to burn more energy. And the last one would be to increase the activity, to make these mice move more, okay? Or maybe it's a combination of all these three things, or two of these three things. 
So we looked at these things systematically in our studies. First, we looked at, uh, in both the prevention and the reversal study, the effect of quorum treatment on the intake of food. And the good news here for all the people, uh, for peop the people that would be maybe taking these, these drugs, is that it really has no effect. Uh, the prevention study, we, we only looked at one week early on. Uh, but for the reversal study, we looked at the four, first four weeks of treatment with these quorums. Uh, we saw that the groups that got the IP injection, whether they got saline or quorum, they tended to eat a little bit less than the mice that we didn't touch at all, maybe due to a little bit of stress of handling and the injections, uh, at least in the first couple weeks. But there's really no difference in the food intake in these quorum-treated animals as compared to mice that are getting the uh, control injections or the injections with the inactive compounds. So what this says is that it's really not restricting the amount of food that these mice are eating. They're losing this tremendous amount of weight and they really don't decrease their food intake at all. The next thing we looked at, the uh, index of metabolism by oxygen consumption. We put these mice in specially designed metabolic cages where we can measure the oxygen consumption, the carbon, carbon dioxide production, the food intake as I showed you in the previous study, also the movement and heat production. And what we saw in both the prevention and the reversal studies was this dramatic increase. Uh, you see in the reversal study almost a doubling in the oxygen consumption rate by these animals. So they are really increasing the metabolism uh, at a, at, with uh, uh, quorum treatment. So it really revs up the metabolism of these mice. And that's what we think promotes the weight loss. And why do we think that? Because when we look at the activity in both the prevention and the reversal studies, we really don't see any effect of the quorum treatment on the activity. Interestingly, and this is just an aside, in this prevention study, these mice that are given the high fat with the quorum A1 have significantly lower body weights than this group right here, yet they're not any more active. So something tells me that we've sort of dissociated um, the uh, activity from the weight loss in this model. Uh, we did a similar study when we, we were induced heme oxygenase 1. And when you induce heme oxygenase 1, the mice also lose weight, but they also become more active. So something you know, is sort of interesting that carbon monoxide can promote weight loss, but it doesn't really have any effect of, on activity, and that you know, high fat feeding probably has an effect on activity that is on a pathway that is not touched by uh, increases in carbon monoxide. One of the significant complications of obesity is that it promotes insulin resistance. And so we looked at the uh, insulin resistance in our uh, mice that we treated with uh, our quorum compounds by looking at uh, fasting blood glucose and fasting uh, insulin levels. Um, we, saw we saw effects of quorum to uh, lower fasting blood glucose levels as early as six weeks of treatment and this effect was sustained throughout the uh, study. It also had a dramatic effect on uh, plasma fasting insulin levels. It, it, it basically normalized the fasting insulin levels at weeks 24 and 30 of, of the uh, study. So not only does it promote weight loss, but it also increases uh, insulin sensitivity in these animals. By far, one of the most impressive effects that this quorum had in our study was its effect it had to remodel the visceral adipocytes, okay? This is data from the prevention study animals. And you could see that uh, controlled condition, uh, when you look at the animals that we put on high fat diet and gave the inactive compound, that they have very large uh, adipocytes and not very many of them. When you go back, uh, when you treat the animals with quorum, you can see that it totally remodels the phenotype of these adipocytes from these large inflamed adipocytes to these smaller, more quote unquote healthy adipocytes. So it decreases the adipocyte size, okay? It also alters the profile of these adipocytes as far as uh, expression of important meta genes in, in that are involved in metabolism, such as PGC1 alpha, dramatic increases in PGC1 alpha in both the prevention and in the uh, reversal study. Uh, NRF1, uh, it's another mitochondrial target uh, in the prevention and in the reversal study. And also uncoupling protein goes up dramatically uh, in these animals as well. So it sort of has an effect on the adipocytes themselves to remodel them to a more of a fat burning to rather than a fat storing phenotype, a so-called so beijing of the uh, uh, 
uh, visceral uh, adipocytes with chronic quorum treatment. One of, another complication of obesity is uh, the inflammation that's associated with it. Now, there's very, it's very controversial. There's a lot of literature, you know, a lot of questions of whether obesity promotes inflammation or inflammation drives the obesity. I'm not here to try to settle that dispute, but one of the things that comes out of this research is that the adipocytes, uh, uh, one of the uh, drivers of this inflammation is believed to be these high mobility group box protein one. This HMGB1 protein, mainly derived from the adipocytes, then goes on to activate uh, pro-inflammatory pathways. And it's believed that this pathway is one of the pathways by which obesity can promote uh, inflammation. So we looked at this uh, uh, HMGB1 pathway in our quorum treated animals. And what we saw in both the prevention and the reversal study was a dramatic decrease in HMGB1 levels in the adipocytes from these high fat fed animals uh, in both the prevention and the reversal study. Again, suggesting that not only does quorum uh, lower body weight increase your metabolism, but it also has potent anti inflammatory actions in obesity. And lastly, uh, one of the, one, another serious complications of obesity is this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It affects up to 75 to 100 million individuals. It occurs in up to 66% of patients over, 60, over uh, 50 years old with diabetes and obesity. And I can tell you, I work very closely with our um, chief of uh, transplant surgery uh, who does a lot of liver transplants, and he tells me that it's, it's very difficult to find, it's almost impossible to find a, in Mississippi, where I, where, where I come from, to find a, a liver for transplant that doesn't have some degree of significant cetosis. Okay? So they really have to make a lot of tough decisions about which organs are going to, uh, livers are going to transplant due to the degree of cetosis in these livers. And the, another thing about NAFTL is that there's really no current FDA approved treatments for this condition. Okay? So what we did is we looked at the liver fat and these are, this is data that we get from our reversal studies, the animals that were already fat, and you know, we treated them with quorum for 30 weeks, and they lost a, a lot of weight. And we, fought, we saw, not surprisingly, that they had decreased levels of uh, lipids in the liver by oil red oil staining. They also had a reduced liver size when we looked at the liver weight to a tibia length ratio, suggesting that quorum can also alleviate um, obesity-induced uh, uh, fatty liver. Now, whether this is due to strictly the tremendous loss of body weight uh, found, so observed in these mice, or it's a direct effect on the liver, uh, we're not uh, that sure right now. Um, okay, so what is the major limitation of anti-obesity drugs? Why don't we have more anti-obesity drugs? You know, this is a significant problem in the United States and worldwide. What is the significant, what is the problem? Well, this is the problem. This is the adverse cardiovascular side effects. So there's a number of uh, drugs that can help you lose weight. You know, there's Fenfen uh, from years ago. Well, that was pulled because it called pulmonary hypertension, heart, heart valve disease. You can have beta-3 agonists. Beta-3 agonists, you can lose a lot of weight in beta-3 agonists. However, they're going to give you tachycardia and they're going to give you hypertension. Okay? Melanocortin-4 receptor agonists. This is a new emerging area. This is a very hot area. but the studies from our department have shown convinced clearly that when you antagonize the MC4 receptor, it results in hypertension. So, you know, there's a lot of agents, again, that increase your metabolism that can help you lose body weight, but they never make it to the clinic because they have adverse cardiovascular side effects. Well, what about carbon monoxide? What about quorums? So we did this study. Um, we did a study, and this is an animal called a spontaneously hypertensive rat. It's more a, a, a model of hypertension. However, they do exhibit uh, visceral obesity, but it's not a cl classical obese, uh, uh, obesity model. So we did a study with these rats where we treated them for a period of 22 uh, weeks with uh, corums. Um, you can see, again, similar to what we found in our mice, it takes a while for these quorums to have an effect, about uh, 12 weeks of treatment before we start seeing any effect on body weight. But after this 12-week treatment period, the uh, mice that we treat with quorum A1 stop gaining weight on this high, uh, stop gaining weight, and the animals that uh, uh, control animals keep on uh, uh, gaining weight. More importantly, what we saw when we looked at the blood pressure, and this is direct blood pressure by telemetry, so this is direct 
measurement of blood pressure. We saw that at, 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 after five weeks treatment with Coram, we saw a reduction in blood pressure that was consistent throughout the 13 uh, time, um, week time period. Now the problem with this study, was, and this was done for technical reasons, we were sharing equipment and we couldn't extend our study, but at the 13 time week, excuse me, at the 13 week time point, you can see it's, it's right at the time point where they start losing, uh, uh, start, uh, stop uh, gaining weight uh, in response to the uh, uh, diet. And you know, we really don't know what happens at later time points and we like to extend these, these studies, but it's very encouraging studies, very encouraging data that we observe no increase in blood pressure despite this lowering of body weight, increases in metabolism. So this suggests that these may be uh, safe uh, compounds to use uh, cardiovascularly. All right, lastly, I'd just like to go real quick through this, but what if, so we were trying to, to decide, you know, what if we try to inhale carbon monoxide instead of inject it, okay? So what we did is we did a study, and this is the hormesis effect of carbon monoxide. You know, I just put this together last night because it just occurred to me, you know, I really, I have to admit, I really had no idea about this phenomenon until I attended this meeting this week. But you can look, this, this is, I, I guess, a, a, class, a classic effect of a hormetin. I don't know, Dr. Rattan, but maybe this is a classic effect. You see very low concentrations, 50 parts per million in the literature. Uh, if shown to be lowering blood pressure and it's protective against acute kidney injury. When you get up to about 200 parts per million, again, you get a slight headache, but it's also been shown to be protective of, against acute kidney injury and also ischemia reperfusion injury of the gut and liver. Then when you get up to the higher levels of carbon monoxide, you know, death, not surprisingly, death uh, uh, occurs. So there really is this uh, hormesis effect of, of CO uh, exposure. So what we wanted to do, we wanted to do two different studies. We wanted to do one study where we looked at a, a, a little bit higher levels, this 200 parts per million, which, which was shown in the literature to be protective against acute kidney injury. And then we wanted to do a low dose. So we wanted to go a little bit lower than 50 parts per million. We, did, we settled at, at 20, at 20 parts per million, which is about the amount of, cigar, uh, of CO you would be exposed to in a cigarette smoke. So this is our inhalation chamber. Uh, we put the mouse, the mice in here. You can see that they're in their home cages. Uh, all we do is take the lid off the cage, just stick it in this chamber, and then we are able to manipulate the level of carbon monoxide in the air. So it's pretty non-stressful. They, they really don't know, and you know, they just go right into here, and, and they're really in their home cage, just running around uh, normally. So we did, this is a pilot data that shows the, the saturation of carboxyhemoglobin at different uh, levels of CO inhalation. The high level was 200 parts per million for one, ho one hour, and it, you see a dramatic increase from about 3% all the way up to close to 25% saturation, which is still elevated after an hour, but is returned to normal after an hour and a half. Uh, the lower doses increase uh, modestly carboxyhemoglobin, uh, especially the 20 parts per million, the low dose that we did. It, it increases it significantly, but it goes from three to six, okay, and then it's right back down after an hour. So this is the study. We, put, we did a, a uh, reversal and a um, uh, prevention study at the same time. Uh, we did two doses. Uh, the CO turned out to be 28 parts per million on average daily with a lower dose. It was kind of difficult to, to dial in the low dose of CO with our system, but we were able to get the higher dose, the 200 parts per million, um, dialed in pretty, pretty good. Um, and so this is the, um, showing you the, both the prevention and the reversal data here. And I got really excited right here. So we saw this is after about 12 weeks, and this is also shown in the literature. We saw nice uh, decreases in um, uh, uh, body weight in, in both groups compared to the normal fat uh, animals uh, early on. And so I was getting ready to set up my uh, CO inhalation clinics in Beverly Hills. I was gonna find a doctor, you know, and I was gonna become a millionaire. I was going to spend all my money, and you know, the bad thing we decided to do was we decided to keep on going with the study. I just, we decided we were gonna do this for 30 weeks, so we kept the study going. And unfortunately, after that part, um, I guess I got a little hubris there. I got too excited because by the end of the time frame, we saw absolutely no differences in uh, body weight in the uh, inhalation animals as compared to the control animals. And, you know, we looked out here, I didn't show the data, but there was no effect 
on the uh, uh, size of the different fat depots. There's no effect of uh, regulation, uh, remodeling of the adipocytes. There's no protective effect of uh, fatty liver. There's no uh, anti-diabetic effect. There's really no effect uh, we saw at the end of our study. So um, we really, you know, we really were disappointed, but, you know, that's why we do the studies that time. So it doesn't appear that inhalation, inhalation does have, a, you know, somehow it has an early transient effect, but this effect somehow is not sustained. Uh, with that, I'd just like to take, thank my uh, uh, collaborators on this project, Dr. Peter Hosick, who's currently a professor or assistant professor at Montclair State University in, in New York. Uh, he did most of this work. Uh, Dr. John Hall, whose lab that we did a lot of the oxygen consumption studies. And of course, uh, Dr. Romaldi at the University of Mississippi made us all the uh, quorum uh, A1. And then lastly, I'd like to thank the NIH and the American Heart Association for um, their support. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, so the question was, how long did we take the quorum therapy out? We took the quorum therapy out for 30 weeks in both the prevention and the reversal studies. And after about 13 or 14 weeks, from 14 weeks onwards, we saw a consistent decrease in body weight the whole time through. Yes, the, the uh, comment was that the uh, quorum seemed to decrease blood pressure way before it had any effect on the body weight. It, yeah, it did. Um, you know, not surprisingly, it's a potent vasodilator. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, that could be very important. The uh, question was, do I think that CO could explain the weight gain after people stop smoking? Um, that's a good question. Um, our inhalation studies, you can see the lower levels was about what you would see with cigarette smoke. And if you look at the data, it, there was a trend for those animals to actually be a little bit heavier uh, than the control animal, than the normal fat, I mean the, the, the high fat fed animal. So, I don't think so. I, I initially thought that same, I had the same idea you did when we saw the data initially, that okay, maybe, you know, this is, could be a, but I, after looking at all of our data, the chronic levels, I think that people that chronically smoke, I don't think it is playing a significant effect. So the question was, did uh, the carbon monoxide inhalation lower blood pressure, and did we try intermittent carbon monoxide inhalation to see if we can reset the system? Um, unfortunately, the, the answers to both those questions are no. We didn't look at a, a blood pressure in these studies. And to be honest with you, we sort of, you know, I was very excited when we got the preliminary, the first part of that data, when we saw early on this, this effect. Uh, that we were having on body weight with inhalation, but after the end of the study, when you know everything, we basically went back to normal. We really haven't followed that up, so no, we haven't done anything like that. So we're we're really focused on these co these injectable quorums. You know, I, I I struggle with what's the best way to deliver these compounds, and you know, I know a lot of people take anti-inflammatories th through injection, like these monoclonal antibodies, which are very effective anti-inflammatory agents, are taken by injection. So I think if we can work out the chemistry of these, these agents and maybe have them work a little bit longer or target them to adipocytes, maybe we can get away with an injection model where patients inject themselves once a month uh, with these drugs. So I, I'm sort of not down on the injection model yet. Yeah, so the question was about the kinetics. When we inject it, where do we think it goes? So yeah, that's exactly the point. I, I, I believe, we, we haven't looked at this at all, 
But I believe that that's why the, the injection model works more sustained. So we inject it in the intrapreneurial cavity. It doesn't go, some of it goes into the blood, finds its way into the blood, but a lot of it goes directly to the adipose where it can have an effect. And we believe, I, you know, the pathways, what does it do? Does it do it through P38? Does it do it through cyclic GMP? Is it direct effect on mitochondria? Those are the things that we're trying to work out right now.